Welcome to LSE for the evening's hybrid event hosted by the LSE European Institute and Bocconi University. My name is Angelo Martelli and I'm an assistant professor in European and International Political Economy at the LSE European Institute, as well as the program director for the LSE Bocconi double degree in European and International Public Policy and Politics. I'm very pleased to be welcoming EBRD president Odile Renovato uh, to LSC for this evening's event. And delighted to be joined by Catherine Degri, Dean for International Affairs that you actually see on video, um, and Eric Neumeyer, LSC President and Vice Chancellor at Inter. We will probably introduce, properly introduce our speaker shortly, but before we do so, I would like to ask those of you who are here to please put your phones on silent so as not to disrupt the event. The event is being recorded and will hopefully be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulty. As usual, there will be a chance for you to put your questions to our speaker and I will let you know when we will open the floor for questions. This event marks the fifth anniversary of the LSE Bocconi Double Degree in European and International Public Policy and Politics. And we are delighted President Renova so accepted our joint invitation to deliver this lecture magistrale. The double degree with, between our two universities, beyond the intrinsic academic value, is of particular significance in this historical moment. Marked by wars and conflicts and bound to become even more complex in a global election. When thinking about partnerships and projects in a geopolitical and economic framework, which characterized Europe for over the last 70 years and now threatened by destabilization and crisis, it is perhaps even more remarkable to listen to one of the central actors of multilateral development and of the global financial architecture. The partnership between our two institutions serves as an idea and as an extraordinary opportunity for our students to pursue knowledge without national barriers. And I underline this from my personal journey, uh, being a proud alumnus of both Bocconi and the LSC, with dual Italian and British nationality from South. <laughs> but like those who plan to develop partners, beyond the achievement of our Made all of this possible from the Bocconi and the I events team, in particular here at the LSC, Pauline Newton and Carolina Stern, to the DRD teams with whom we've been coordinating. But I would also like to acknowledge the general support for our double degree, coming from the Ceres investors and the Poly family that in 2019 established the Ceres Scholarship in order to contribute to the cross-border and European education of new generations in the aftermath of Brexit as part of our double degree, a program which is the result of the collaboration between the LSC and Bocconi University. I will now invite Professor Eric Neumeyer to take the floor. Thank you. A very warm welcome to all of you here at the London School of Economics and Political Science for this evening's event. My name is Eric Neumeyer, and I'm currently the interim president and vice chancellor of the LSE until the end of this month, when Larry Kramer takes over. It is a great honor for me to welcome our online audiences, our audience here with us in the lecture theater, and of course, particularly so our speaker, Odile Bruno Basso, to the LZ today to deliver this Lectio Magistralis, so my pronunciation is probably not as good as Angelo's. This event celebrates the wonderful partnership between the LSE and Bocconi University. Hi, Catherine. Uh, and marks the fifth anniversary of our LSE Bocconi double degree in European International Public Policy and Politics. The LSE's European Institute, which is hosting it tonight, and Bocconi University are among Europe's leading platforms for this for discussion of policy challenges, institutional issues, and wider forces and trends affecting both the European continent and the planet at large. 
the event of tonight is the second leg of our celebration of our double degree following the successful first leg in Milan a few weeks ago. So let me now turn to our fantastic speaker, Odine Werner Basson. She has been the president of the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development since November 2020. She was previously Director General of the French Treasury, where she oversaw the development of France's economic policies, leading on European and international financial affairs, trade policies, financial regulation, and debt management. In this position, she also served as Vice President of the European Economic and Financial Committee, who was deputy to the G7, G20 groups, and French governor or alternative or alternative governor to the World Bank, the BRD, the African Development Bank. She was also the chair of the Paris Club. We could hardly have a more distinguished speaker tonight. The BRD has been engaged in prolonged efforts to support Ukraine's future, the topic of tonight's event, and address the urgency of action and feels particularly special to welcome President Bruno Basso here tonight to give her reflections on such a critical issue for Europe. Now I must say something I'm about to be. Unfortunately, I'm double booked tonight. I have a previous commitment, so I cannot say, but I wanted to make everything possible to be here to introduce you and welcome you tonight. So now I'm happy to please to hand over to Professor Catherine Defries, whom I met many, many years ago, Dean for International Affairs at Brooklyn University. And apologies again that I have to rush it. Thank you very much and have a wonderful event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I hope you can hear me. And uh, if I don't hear anything in return, I think you you do. Uh, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. So a warm welcome to all of you. Uh, my name is Catherine DeVries. I'm a Dean of International Affairs and the Generality Chair of European Policies at Bocconi University. Uh, actually, uh, indeed, uh, following up on uh, on Eric Nyman is nice because we used to also be colleagues uh, on, on the research end. So it's great to also... Uh, see President Neumeyer here today. I would also like to thank uh, Director Matelli for inviting me to this event. And I particularly would like to thank President Renaud Basso to shed light on such a very important topic uh, with us today. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot be there in person. Uh, I do have an excuse that uh, you might uh, find okay in the sense that it's rooted in multilateralism. Uh, we're hosting, uh, together with the OECD, uh, Bocconi, Deloitte and ISPI, which is an international center in, uh, in Milan, uh, the next Future Leaders Conference, where actually also the topic that we're discussing here today will be discussed. And uh, I'm particularly hosting uh, students from the U7 Plus uh, University Alliance of G7 Universities uh, today. So it's been a, a quite busy day, uh, but I'm really, uh, I'm really thankful that I can, I can say a few words here. Um, so it's really wonderful to be part of, indeed, this second leg of the Bocconi LSC double degree celebration of its fifth year anniversary. On behalf of uh, the president uh, and the rector of Bocconi and the entire Bocconi community, I wish us all a great event today. And I'm really happy that we're able to celebrate the fifth anniversary. It follows a great event uh, where also uh, Director Matelli and colleagues was, uh, were present here uh, at, uh, at Bocconi in Milan. Uh, discussing other precious issues that are facing uh, the European continent. We talked about the environment and the Green Deal, banking union, European parliamentary elections. And then today we follow up uh, by uh, a, a key challenge, I think, and, 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 and opportunity, which is Ukraine's destiny in the European Union or Europe more, more, more broadly defined. I think these two great events are a testament of the core of this double degree program, namely that our students are learning about the European continent and its future. And it's been really a pleasure uh, for myself also to help manage this double degree, to teach on the double degree and to supervise great master theses that are coming out of this double degree. I think our this anniversary also is a continued testament of how two of Europe's most prestigious universities, one on the continent and one on the other side of the channel, can keep working closely together 
uh, in a time where there was a lot of political turmoil that might have not made that cooperation easy. Uh, and I was actually reminded by the words of Michel Barnier, uh, for those of you who do not remember, chief negotiator of the EU uh, with uh, the UK on a Brexit agreement, when the opening of the double degree, where he was also uh, featuring online, said that the program is significant because it demonstrates that even post-Brexit, there is a continued academic connection between the UK and the EU. This has led to other important initiatives like being a part both uh, Bocconi and the LSE in the European University Alliance. And uh, I think uh, hopefully many more uh, joint uh, uh, opportunities and, uh, and, and projects. I wish to end by really congratulating all the current students, the alumni, the professors that are also in the room or online and our professional service members that have made this program such a success. It's really a, a gem in our, in our dual portfolios in both universities. Um, now we also have the opportunity in this dual degree program to teach future leaders that will have the opportunity to leave their mark on the great challenges and opportunities facing the European continent. And I look forward to President uh, Rena Basso's thoughtful words on a very important topic for the future, which is Ukraine's destiny and how uh, we will uh, move forward co cooperating closely in uh, possible Ukrainian construction. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, these were the words from my uh, side, and I wish this all a great event. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Professor David. Um, I will now invite uh, President Renaud Basso to take the floor, and uh, we, we will all listen to the lecture magistrale to evoke with me. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you to the Open Institute and Bogan University for inviting me to mark the anniversary of this partnership aimed at encouraging the cross-border European education of new generations post-Brexit. I'm delighted to address students and guests from the London School of Economics and Political Science, the warm philosophers of liberty, such as Ayer and Potter, and to many prisoners closer to our own time. My subject today shown in the picture is Ukraine, and our vision for helping to achieve its European destiny. Ukrainians, Ukrainians have failed to that European destiny since long before the collapse of the Soviet Union. Whether they were living under the Polish Ukrainian Commonwealth, the Russian Empire or the USSR, their idea of self-determination and national identity were inspired by the European Symphony. And after independence in 1991, they could move towards political membership of and integration into Europe. The view of many Ukrainians has long been that the nation state is important but not enough in itself. A secure nation state, they believe, needs a larger association with its neighbors to the West. And this now means the European Union. Such an association would allow Ukraine to fully, fully share in the freedom, security, justice, and sustainable development, which are the values of today's EU. The transformation Ukraine is seeking is also at the core of our mission at the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. As a major institutional investor, throughout all these three decades of independence, we have formed a deep understanding and close relationship with the continent. 
we are strongly committed to Ukraine's development as a modern, democratic, and prosperous nation. At the same time, there has been a learning point for us, for Ukraine's other friends and partners, and I would suggest for Ukraine itself. Over the years, we have come to see that Ukraine's need more, more and different kinds of support and reorienting itself. But we also see a cruel paradox. The terrible war, inflicted on it by its largest neighbor, now threatens Ukraine's shares in the finance. We deplore the human suffering which is the war of Israel. We, as the EPRD, have pledged our unwavering support to the country ever since, ever since the full scale invasion two years ago. But the paradox is that Russian war has also put its minds on how to help Ukraine continue its work and destiny. And to do so even faster. And if Ukraine and other EU can take countries can fully welcome the door of Ukraine, who they suffering in the country? Sorry, the sound is there. The EBRD was created in 1991. This was also the period when countries in what was then called Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union started their post-communist transition. The EBRD was set up to help them make that happen. How did we understand the post-communist transition back then? In general, in two ways. Firstly, Transition from state control to market economies with a sizable private sector. The EBRD's own purpose was defined as to foster the transition towards open market economies and to promote private and entrepreneurial initiative. Secondly, transition from a centralized, often one party political system to pluralist democracy. With insight, however, the transition journey was not a one-size-fits-all. The countries of Central and Eastern Europe, such as Poland, have lived only a few decades under communism. Others, such as Ukraine, secured independence only after 70 years of Soviet rule. And this makes a huge difference. Transition was not easy for any of the states that experienced it. But post-Soviet countries like Ukraine had a much harder road to travel towards a market economy and pluralist democracy. Ukraine, along with other post-Soviet states like Moldova, Georgia, or Armenia, required fundamental transformation. And there were three main reasons for this. First, the post-Soviet countries had darker historical legacies. Second, they had little experience of building national identities and institutions. And thirdly, they suffered from geopolitical tensions with their neighbor to the east one which tries to undermine their efforts at nation building to this day. The historical legacy I will leave to the historians. I will just quote Timothy Snyder's insight that if Europe in the 1930s and 1940s was a dark continent, Ukraine and Belarus were the heart of darkness. And no discussion with, about Ukraine is complete without mention of the tragedy that remains in every Uk Ukrainian heart today, the Holodomor. 
This was the man-made famine of 1932-1933 that followed the collectivization of agriculture and killed millions. The second major challenge they faced was state building, and in some cases, unfinished national buildings. When the Soviet Union collapsed, these countries, Ukraine the largest among them, had no strong tradition of independent statehood. Unlike the Eastern European neighbors, their most, their most recent experience of it was the short-lived and chaotic independence of the years after the First World War. They had no real state institutions. The result for Ukraine and other post-Soviet na nation was years of transition, which we might describe, to be polite, as uneven. Even the potential of the Orange Revolution, when people power overturned a rigged election, failed to be realized by both Ukraine and Europe. For Ukraine, the first real turning point came only 10 years ago. This was the revolution of dignity and the spectacle of Ukrainians fighting and in some cases dying for the European destiny and a European future. This, as well as Russia's annexion of Crimea and the start of the war in the East that same year, 2014, was a pivotal moment, moment for Ukraine and the international community. Let us not forget that the revolution of dignity has its origin in the strong support of the Ukrainian people for an association agreement with the EU. The international focus then shifted to the incentives and resources needed to strengthen good governance and the rule of law reform the judiciary and public administration, and create an independent anti-corruption architecture. At the EBRD, our emphasis has always been on supporting Ukraine's agile and resourceful private sector. But we were also quick to grasp the importance of the new realities. Although Ukraine faced unprecedented challenges and an urgent need to reform, it still lacked the capacity to do so. So after 2014, we massively scaled up our policy work and became an enabler of reform. We supported the establishment of a business ombudsman to bring greater transparency in business. And we helped set up teams of bright Ukrainian experts in the public administration, smoothing the way for specific reforms, as well as creating the nucleus of a new generation of civil servants. Their focus in the early days was on EU integration, alignment with EU regulation, advisory work with SMEs, and improvements to public procurement. These teams have been equally successful in wartime, supporting Ukraine's EU membership application and quickly turning to emergency planning and prepar preparation for reconstruction. Ukraine has now set itself on a strategic path of wide ranging reforms underpinned by the aspiration to integrate with the rest of Europe. The old oligarchic model of political economy was hard to get rid of. But reformers in government and in parliament, as well as Ukraine's civil society, have continued to fight for what they believe is need and is right. They know how important good governance was and will continue to be for rallying support for reconstruction. Let me turn now to the third major obstacle to Ukraine transition and statehood I mentioned earlier, geopolitics. Again, with hindsight, 
we should have been more alert to this risk. Unfortunately, in the years after 2014, Ukraine remained stuck in between two poles. To the east, it faced Russia, which had never accepted that Ukraine should decide on its Europe, Europe, European future for itself. On the west, it looked towards the EU. The EU has served as a potent, powerful center of gravity for most countries in the region. But at first, it had been cautious to embrace Ukraine. This was in stark contrast to the welcome Brussels extended to Central and Eastern Europe nations at the beginning of this century. The uncertainty of Ukraine's geopolitical position meant that even with the positive impetus of the post-2014 reforms, geopolitics continued to be a strong drag on its transformation. Then came Russia's full-scale invasion two years ago. The shock in Europe and beyond and the bravery and resolve of Ukrainians in defending their country and their European future brought about another turning point in international thinking. If there, if there has been any doubt before, there was now broad agreement that Ukraine belonged to Europe, in Europe. Events moved fast. Just, just five days into the biggest war in Europe since 1945, Ukraine formally applied for EU membership, followed by Moldova and Georgia. In June 2022, in record time, the EU formally recognized their European prospects and granted them candidate status. And in last December, in a truly historic breakthrough, the EU decided to launch accession negotiations with the two countries, Ukraine and Moldova. The EBRD's response to Russia's aggression was equally swift and strong. We were the first development bank to commit to continuing to invest and to taking the risk of our own, on our own balance sheet. It was very unusual for a bank like ours to operate like this in wartime. But we saw this as absolutely the right thing to do. With support from our donors, who covered half of the risk, commit, we first committed to sharply raising the volume of finance we deployed in Ukraine. And we then delivered significantly more than the 3 billion euros we had pledged for 2022 and 2023. In fact, the current total is now above 4 billion euros. We chose to support the real economy and critical infrastructure, keeping the lights on and the, train run, the trains running as the best way to help the private sector and the resilience of the country as a whole. Our work on energy security, infrastructure, food security, trade, and the private sector has helped major state-owned companies as well as our private sector clients and the Ukrainian people at large. At the end of last year, our governors also agreed to a capital increase for the bank of 4 billion euros. This will enable us to keep investing in Ukraine in wartime and in reconstruction, in wartime at the current level. And when the time comes, it will help provide more funds for reconstruction. In parallel, we have continued to support Ukraine's reform because only a stronger better run Ukraine can both win the war and secure EU membership. Ukraine leaders on their side have focused on reforms too. In the early days of the war, 
my concern, my worry, was that all the energy would be invested in the military effort and with much less attention paid to structural change and governance. But very impressively, we have seen an ever-increasing capacity to deliver with growing unity and efficiency in decision-making. In fact, Ukraine has risen courageously both to the challenge of the war and that of reform. And in its hour of need, it has developed a new sense of statehood and nationhood, one that is strongly oriented towards Europe. We can see what Europe and the EU have to offer Ukraine. I now want to say a few words about what Ukraine can contribute to the rest of Europe and the world. Integrating, U integrating Ukraine into the EU will come with challenges. Some of them are already apparent. So we need to be clear about the many benefits its accession will bring with it. Ukraine would be the largest country to join the EU since Poland did 20 years ago. When, once reconstruction began, its economy has the potential to grow by 5% a year. And it could also attract large volumes of foreign direct investment, spurring innovation and growing connectivity across the EU. It is already an exporter of steel, electricity, technology, including ICT and cybersecurity skills, and much more. And its human capital, with strengths in engineering, private enterprise, and innovation, could help EU companies move their supply chains much closer to home. This is especially true of the IT, defense, and climate sectors, which are likely to be the EU focus in the years ahead. Ukraine is also an agribusiness power, one blessed with very fertile black hairs. Its produce is vital for food security in Europe and in the global south. Indeed, its grain covers up to a quarter of imports needs in countries such as Egypt, Indonesia, and Pakistan. And Bangladesh, sorry. It has the largest gas reserves in Europe after Norway and good energy connections with the EU. Its untapped renewables offer investment opportunities in the range of $10 billion a year. If fully exploited, its potential could contribute significantly to Europe's energy security and its transition to a net zero world. Ukraine has a highly a highly educated population with strong ties to the rest of Europe. And with help from institutions like ours, Ukrainians who have grown since independence are already mastering the skills they need to develop their country further and to achieve their goal of EU membership. A secure, successful, and well-run Ukraine will bring many benefits to Europe. Its proposed membership and the EU's further enlargement could give the Union the sort of boost Poland and other Central Euro and Eastern Europe, European countries did when they joined. That enlargement did deliver more economic growth in countries which were already EU members for both before and after the, the expansion. And just within eight years from the 2004 enlargement, the percentage of FDI to the then EU from the rest of the world doubled as the share of GDP. Backing Ukraine and its accession to the EU now in particular is an investment in the security and stability of us all. And not to support it today would be to store up many more problems, costing us far more financially for later. One final point, the war 
has also highlighted Ukrainian qualities of courage, resilience, patriotism, and a willingness to make sacrifices which reflect Europe's own values. We owe it to Ukraine and to ourselves to do all we can to help Ukrainians fulfill their European destiny. Since February 2022, I have visited the country three times. The first trip was in October of that year, 2022, just a week after Russia's first mass massive missile attack on critical energy infrastructure. I could see from my own eyes the damage from missile strikes in Kiev and the destruction of the town of Irpin by Russian shelling. The war has inflicted terrible costs. But with international, international support, Ukraine's economy is still de delivering for its people. Its institutions need strengthening. But in many ways, they are in better shape now than before the war. Its people, tired and traumatized, are they are, remi remained determined to defend their country. They have not lost their belief in victory or their hope for a brighter future in Europe as part of, of their destiny. It is a face that we share with them. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, President Reno Basso, for this speech. Um, we will now proceed in the following way. Um, I will kick off by asking just a couple of questions to then move to um, two students who are actually, one is the president of the U Ukrainian society, the LSE, another one is actually the representative of our double degree uh, students with Bocconi. Then we have as you can see from the clock, ample time for questions for the, from the rest of the audience. So President uh, Reno Basso, um, let's go back for a moment to uh, the end of February, uh, 2022. Uh, we wake up to Russia's full scale invasion of Ukraine, one of the BRD's largest countries of operation. So first, how did your institution respond and how did you decide what to prioritize in your support? So um, the first thing we did, um, and I remember very well, this very early morning, I remember looking at my phone at five o'clock in the morning and having information from um, that um, the attack has started. Um, so the first thing we did was a very clear condemnation of, of the attack. And, and it's not always easy for MDB, for a multilateral development institution. We are more financial institution and so forth. So taking such a clear political statement was uh, obvious for us, but, uh, but it's not always obvious for, for an MDB. The second thing, thing we did was um, bringing together our board, and I see some board members here, uh, and um, and discussing what's what next, what, what should we do? Uh, we took immediately the decision to uh, formally suspend all our investment in Russia. Russia used to be the largest countries of operation of EBRD. Uh, it was a very important country for us. We invested a lot uh, in Russia. We had, informally stopped any new investment in Russia since 2014 um, uh, in agreement with the shareholder, which at that point of time said they will not approve any new project in Russia. But in um, when the war started, we decided to take a very formal uh, decision that we cannot disburse any and provide any new sort of financing to Russia and Belarus. And this was uh, uh, decided in the few weeks, you know, formally we had the agreement of the board and the governors uh, this took that very strong stance. 
And then we started to think about what kind of support we can provide to Ukraine. And, and to be frank, it's a very tough decision for a bank. So at the beginning, we were a bit on the, on the you know, looking what what was going on with the ground. And, and, and it was not obvious. I, you remember the few first days of the war, Russian advance was very, I mean, was moving quickly and so forth. So the resilience of the country was not, I mean, was not a given. And so, um, but very quickly, we decided that we needed to provide, to continue to support Ukraine, so to continue to disburse to our clients, to, we had some ongoing project, we decided to continue to implement them. And, um, and we started to explore how we can do that. We are so I was saying financial institution, institution, we have a AAA rating, which is an important element for a bank, for our credibility. So we saw that the best way forward was to take risk on our balance sheet because, because we saw that this was our duty, but also to share support from shareholders to share the risk with us. And we got a lot of support. Overall, uh, in the last two years, we received 1.6 billion of guarantees, grants from shareholders to be able to take part of the risk. And, uh, and we started to provide some financing very quickly um, to support um, our clients in, uh, and, and the government in the, in the country. Thank you very much. Um, well, since then, you, you traveled actually to the country three times, uh, if I'm correct, and met with Ukrainian authorities multiple times, including a couple of weeks ago here in London. Um, how has your interaction changed uh, over this period? And what do you think is the biggest concern going forward? Is it the situation on the ground in Ukraine? or the potentially different geopolitical constellation by the end of this year, by the end of 2024? So I think, first of all, on, on the, the first part of your question, the evolution of the, of the relationship and, and what I see. So the, the resolution and the determination and the commitment of the government and all of the, of, of the country to, to fight this war and to win this war was very clear since the beginning. What I see, we what I think we we was not, I mean, was not a given there also, but we really saw that coming quite quickly was the unity, the national. You know, Ukraine is a country where you have a lot of political, I mean, uh, debate, uh, strong opposition, vivid, um, I mean, vibrant uh, democracy in a way, and but in that circumstances, because of the national independence at stake, the sense of unity and the capacity to act quickly, not only, of course, on the military front and so forth, but as I was saying, to, to implement reforms, to do what, I mean, take decision in order to be able to, I mean, steer the economy, uh, make reforms that are important for the uh, EU negotiation progress uh, process and so forth. So I saw that, I mean, um, developing in the in the last two years in terms of risk i mean they are very wide i think there is a, of course a military situation which is uh, which is uh, challenging and uh, that's where i mean additional support and rapid support is needed i think in terms of munition ammunition and support we are not expert in that area but we see that it's a very important um, element but We've always been advocating in the last two years of the importance also of the economic support, because in a way, um, you, I mean, for the country to be able to sustain the world, world war, to have some finance, to get some domestic resources, raise taxes and so forth, you need to have a functioning economy to keep people to 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 preserve people's jobs in the country, you need to have companies working and you need to have a government and, a, and an administration working. So I think I see both the need for support, both on the military and on the economic side as very complementary. And, um, and the, the challenge is to keep the level of support and, and even increase uh, what was received in the last few years uh, in a context, in a geopolitical context, which is, uh, which is not easy with elections, important elections coming up in a number of, of countries. Thank you very much. So uh, may I have a mic uh, for the first row where we actually have some representatives of the Ukrainian society uh, at the LSC. Uh, and may I ask Danilo uh, Nikiforov, to introduce yourself and uh, 
Hi, my name is Danilo, uh, Danilo Nikifrov, and I'm the president of the Ukrainian Society at the LEC. And thank you so much for the talk. And as I said before, uh, we welcome the decision of inviting Ukrainians into the conversations about the Ukraine and the Ukrainians. So my question would be, uh, are there any projects? Of course, there are, but could you please elaborate on them, uh, particularly what projects and what the ability does to ensure Ukraine's uh, energy security and energy independence during uh, the war, particularly given that most of the energy exports come from uh, Russia itself, the aggressor. And my kind of follow-up to this question would be, is Yiberti prepared to inv invest in Ukraine right now during the war and when the risk is so high and particularly when there are so many social issues and unemployment and economy decline when uh, the support from international partners is actually needed today? Thank you. Thank you very much. So energy has indeed been, been a sector where we worked a lot and invested a lot uh, in dif for different uh, things. The first thing we we did was to help Naftogaz, so the gas company, to buy gas. And it's uh, it was a, we, we had a liquidity support for, for the company, revolving credit line, in order to buy gas uh, on international markets, in order to be to have sufficient storage to survive the winter. And uh, and we've done that twice, so two times uh, uh, 300 uh, million of credit line in order to um, to be able to have um, to be safe on, on the safe side with gas storage uh, to be because the winter in Ukraine can be very tough. Uh, you need people to have access to heating, you need gas to have manufacturing uh, companies functioning and so forth. So we saw that this was a top priority. And uh, we got a lot of support from shareholders to be able to do that. The second big activity we had on the energy sector was to support the network company, in particular when in uh, autumn, October 2022, Russia started as a very clear tactics to bomb the network, um, the electricity network in order to trigger blackout and to frighten people or to make the situation unsustainable for people and push for a big um, a big migration uh, wave. And uh, Ukraine Ergo, we knew them very well. We worked a lot with them on the transformation of the governance of the company. So the company is working very well. And we uh, provided them with a lot of financing in order to help them make re repairing the destruction of the infrastructure as quickly as it was uh, destroyed. So help them to buy the material needed, generators and uh, interconnectors and so forth. It was a huge challenge in this winter, the 2022-2023 winter, and now we help them to build shelters to protect the infrastructure so as to avoid that it remains a sort of target for, for bombing. Um, other project we've been doing is with the, the hydroelectricity company, which was very much um, uh, damaged by, there were a big attack on the dam, a very important dam on the, on the river. And we've provided them a uh, few months ago. And it's a good example of uh, EBRD Italian partnership because it was done with uh, Italian uh, support uh, from uh, Casa di Depositi. And so we have a joint financing for the hydroelectricity company. Energy will remain the top priority in what we will continue to do. As I was saying, Ukraine has a lot of potential in terms of renewable and uh, we, will, we will be uh, working with, with the our different clients in order to support um, energy security and uh, um, and uh, and uh, green transition in Ukraine. It's also a big asset for Europe because uh, Ukraine has a huge storage capacity, the biggest in Europe, I think, and uh, uh, very safe. And now it's it's used as a storage for other European countries. So that shows also the contribution of the country in energy security in Europe in general. Thank you. Um, and then can I then ask for Justin Casino is actually the student representative of the double degree, uh, Lisi Bocconi, to uh, take the mic. Hello, thank you so much for your presentation. It was really interesting. I had a question regarding um, the EBR, EBRD's uh, role and relations with other international and multilateral institutions. So I wanted to ask, how does the EBRD collaborate with other multilateral institutions like the European Union, the IMF or the World Bank? 
and uh, how do you coordinate efforts to support Ukraine's European aspirations? And uh, following that, uh, what would you say makes the EBRD different uh, from the latter organizations that I mentioned uh, in its support for Ukraine? Thank you. <laughs> It could be a long day presentation, but um, so we work a lot with the other MDBs. Um, we really believe that we need all the different balance sheets to work on Ukraine. I mean, the needs are very important, the risks are very high, so it's very useful to be not to have all the risks concentrated on one organization. So that's why I mean we work very very well with the others. In the first weeks after the beginning of the war, we set up. A sort of coordination group with other IFI, so IMF, World Bank, EB, EIB, um, IFC, uh, so the key institution working in Ukraine, in order to exchange. I mean, I was what what I what it, I mean each of us were doing, how to coordinate, how to define priorities, how to uh, agree on a sort of common approach, and this group is still functioning. So we have regular very regular talks about who is doing what we've been we are the i mean we've been the most active i would say in in our field at least the private sector and so forth the world bank has been a very important channel to uh, budgetary support uh, used by a number of countries as a guarantee that the money was uh, landing at the right place with the right people and so forth. So as a sort of a conduit for budget support but we are i mean working very closely with eib we has Often we work with the same clients on um, on complementary projects. What is very important, I think we've worked together, for example, on a common approach to procurement in order to simplify, because the country is in war, it has huge needs, uh, it doesn't need to, to be able to, to you know, to spend a lot of time to coordinate different institutions doing different things and so forth. So we try to simplify for, for the benefit of the country what we are doing. So, for example, we agreed on the same procurement approach. Uh, and we also very much work on having the same conditions, you know, attached to the different financing. The fact that there is an IMF program has been a very important uh, positive development in Ukraine in uh, in 2023. I think it, it it provides an anchor for the government and for the different institution, you know, providing macroeconomic visibility, clarity, and so forth. So it's been very very effective in that respect, and I hope it will continue to be uh, uh, well implemented and, and well financed. And the last point of your question was how do we support? Um, EU accession process. So we, uh, as I explained, we do not only provide uh, financing for projects, so loans, and but we also provide policy support. And in Ukraine, since 2014, we have set up what we call the Ukraine Reform Architecture, which is a team of experts we finance with grant financing that is there to support the government in the um, reform agenda and now in the EU accession process. So these are experts that we finance and provide additional resources with high level, I mean, high skilled people to support this agenda, which will be very demanding because there is a huge ambition uh, to go quickly, but we know that it's a broad, very broad agenda I mean, in terms of taking the acquis communautaire and so forth. So that will require a lot of um, support. Thank you very much. So we will now open uh, the floor to the Q&A with the rest of the audience. Uh, I can see a lot of hands going up already. So um, if you can please raise your hand uh, and I select, I guess, questions in round since we have so many. Um, if you can let us know your name and affiliation and wait for the steward uh, to come with the rowing mic to get to you. So um, let's start here in the middle and then we move there in the third row. Thank you for the talk. Uh, it was very interesting. Um, from you my can just say who you are. So yes, that... sorry. My name is Paulina Gulbe. I'm a master's student at London School of Economics. I'm doing political economy and previously studied European affairs in uh, science Po. So even from the talk that you just uh, just gave, it was interesting to see the sort of political angle that uh, that you took. That's quite um, unusual for for this sort of institution. And my question leads into this as well. As EBRD is um, owned by 72 countries and that uh, constitutes its uh, board of governors that then directly um, Im impacts the, the appointed directors, 
how easy or more difficult is it for EBRD to take swift, swift action in cases like the invasion of Ukraine? And how easy or hard is it for the investments to be deployed to the country? And you also mentioned uh, quite directly the questions of uh, Ukraine's accession to the EU, which is a very contested question within European Union itself. So how is it more easy or difficult to take that sort of stance as EBRD? And if so, why? Thank you. If I can go to the, yes, the lady in the third row. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Nigia Jafarova, uh, economist. Um, so my question is about re uh, reforms in Ukraine. Uh, so uh, during wartime, we all know that it's difficult, challenging to implement reforms, but Ukraine is doing an amazing job in this. But given your expertise and insights in the country, where do you think, and given the war is going on, where do you think the country should specifically focus on? Uh, not just to accelerate EU accession, but also to attract more FDI foreign investment, which will be crucial for the reconstruction. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. You tell me whether should we get mm -hmm. one more or um... maybe one more. One then. more. Okay. Um, I can let's go to that in uh, in the middle. The gentleman. So to restore some balance. Uh, balance. <laughs> yes. Hi, Mark Hickton, the Ukraine and the Working Group, uh, Department of Business and Trade, um, ex Destin. Uh, cost of uh, collateral is going to be a key critis uh, a critical factor for reconstruction. Uh, are there um, lessons we can learn from uh, Greece uh, and uh, how systemic um, institutions have been created and uh, what needs to be done to strengthen the systemic framework of banks? Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the question. And so on the on the first question, on the swift, the capacity of an institution like EBRD to take a swift action, um, it's a good question. And I think that um, often it's, it's you know we need to bring different uh, members different different countries with different vision and so forth um to a same position to be able to act in the case of ukraine the sense of unity and um and support we've got from the shareholders to be able to take risk was amazing. And I think that was, uh, um, that's quite unique, I would say. It's very much related, I think, to the, to the view of what is the EBRD mandate. So the fact that we were very active already in Ukraine and that um, this invasion was seen as really against, I mean, all the international rules and so forth. So, and the, the, the fact that we, were able to deploy concrete investment in the country in order to support the economy was really seen as very important from our shareholders. So, um, so the the fact that this was, I mean, reflected in the fact that we get so much support uh, in terms of uh, guarantees and so forth, so it was to enable us to to really act. Um, so that's that's quite. Um, I think that was quite. Um, unique and related to the circumstances, but but it really shows that institutions like that, when you know you have a common vision, can really deploy and be very effective in uh, in action. Um, on the project, um, so we we work a lot with with we were already very present in Ukraine, so we had a lot of very good knowledge of the administration, the client, private sector clients, the banking sector, and so forth. So we managed to address them I and mean, identify their needs and address their needs um, very quickly. What What is clear, for example, there were, there is a lot of um, desire, uh, expectation from government to see new foreign direct investment in the country. So foreign investors starting to invest in the country, we don't see that so much. This is not so easy in, a, in view of the geopolitical mean, situation, the risk of war and so forth. But what we see is companies already in the country, ready to continue to invest and to pursue their activities and, and to, even if it's not, I mean, they, they are not exp, I mean, not necessarily make, making high returns and so forth, but still willing to continue to remain in the country and to build uh, for the future. In terms of um, accession and, and so forth, we so we are not part of the decision-making at the EU level. I think that we see, we can, I mean, 
see the dynamics of the discussion. And as I was reflecting, I mean, there, is, there are some debate, and it's, it's, but there is also very strong political impetus at the EU level, and it's not going to be an easy process. It's not necessarily going to be a very quick process, but I think that there is an understanding that this is where we need to go um, in um, for Ukraine and, and for the stability of the EU also, because there has been some very important decisions taken. It's not, I mean, we know that this is the beginning and we will still a long way to go, but, but I think that the, the direction is clear. Um, on what the country should reform, um, I would say from, I mean, there, there are a number of things. Um, governance, fight against corruption remains a very important priority. Uh, improving the business environment is also very important. And, uh, you know, we work a lot with, we have this ombudsman, which is uh, working with a private sector and trying to sort out any challenge they have with the administration and so forth. And there are many of them. So I would see that as, as a very, uh, very important priorities uh, moving forward. And then you have all the EU accession uh, agenda, which is a lot of regulation in different sectors and so forth. But as a key pillar, I think this enhanced transparency, good governance, fight against corruption, uh, business environment, really the key priority from our perspective. And there is some progress, but there are still some work uh, to be done. And um, the less, if I understood well, the question was the last question was about lessons from Greece yes. and and the role of the banking sector in um, system, systemic banks and so forth. And I think in in Ukraine, uh, Ukraine in, in a way has been lucky that. Um, there were a big financial crisis, a big banking crisis in um, mid uh, twenty, uh, mid twenty, I mean middle of twenty ten, so around twenty fourteen and so forth. So there has been a huge restructuring of the banking sector at that point of time, and that has played very uh, a very positive role now in the war. Because what is very uh, striking, and it's it's something which uh, struck me very much when I was uh, in the first uh, trip, is the fact that the banking sector has continued to function, uh, not, of course, not in the war zone per se, but everywhere else. You have branches, there were no bank run, access to cash was uh, guaranteed and so forth. So the banking sector was really ready and they were very well organized with a uh, backup uh, structure and so forth. They were well Governed, so the, there were a lot of work done between. I mean, after 2014, on the governance on the banking of the banking sector to bring uh, international expertise, independent board members, and so forth. And even in the public sector bank, um, the, 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 the strength of the governance is, is good, and this has really helped the banking sector to be in a strong position to help the country weather the, the war and the impact of the war. And there has been. Um, uh, in the framework of the IMF program, the central bank has reviewed the assets and so forth, and it's quite positive. I and mean, they see no major weakness in the banking sector now. Of course, it depends on the macroeconomic development and so forth, but uh, it has been resisting quite well. Now. Thank you very much. Okay, let's continue for, uh, where we stopped. Um, there, yeah, yes, thank you. Hi, thank you very much. I have two questions, but feel free to choose one if we're running short on time. Uh, my first question is, provided a scenario uh, that the U.S. election has a bad outcome for Ukraine, how do you see the future and how do you see Europe helping Ukraine and will it be enough? And my second question is, what solutions would help integrate Ukraine into the EU as an agricultural superpower, especially given the recent protests in the agricultural se sector throughout Europe. You. And you are a student of oh, from... LSE, yes. <laughs> and I, my name is Maria. Um, any other questions here? Can yes, in the the row behind and in front. Thanks. Thank you, Miss President, for your insights. My name is Anna Krutova and I'm a communication specialist from Ukraine and uh, your remark uh, of appreciation towards all the people who are working 
to support governmental reforms by the time war started has a special place in my heart because I was based in Kiev by the time war started and I was supporting as a communication specialist electoral reform and public administration reform and it was very hard times to explain first to ourselves why we should still invest in reforms while our future as a state is still at risk so thank you for also highlighting that our EU future is not just dependent on whether we will, will win war or not. But my question is about the future. So uh, the EVRD has played a vital role in uh, rebuilding the Ukrainian infrastructure in the past. So how can we make sure that future infra infrastructure investments are not just rebuilt, but also modernized and sustainable for long term. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the very last, yes, here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Yulia Zuba, um, and I'm pursuing my Master of Public Policy degree at the LSE, um, also from Ukraine, currently working in the Parliament of Ukraine on integration Ukraine to you. And uh, thank you for such interesting insights. Um, in the case of eBRD, what do you think eBRD could do to support, as my colleague mentioned, the, the Ukraine is agriculture country? How are we going to uh, like make sure that we protect Ukrainian agriculture sector and also help agriculture sector to integrate to EU sector? Uh, and the second one, I think it's about more how Ukrainian agriculture sector can contribute to EU economic values, which is also important in terms of uh, on uh, all instability on the borders currently and protest. What, what is your thoughts and what the role of EBRD in that? Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a bit of an overlap between the first and the, and the last question. Okay. Um, so what happens if there is a bad outcome in the US? I mean, it's, um, it's, it's a, I mean, difficult, very difficult question. Um, I, uh, first of all, I hope that, uh, uh, whatever the outcome of the election in the US, there will be continued support for Ukraine, because I think I'm deeply convinced personally that it's in the interest of the US and it is in the interest of the international community. So I don't see that as a sort of, you know, it's depending on who is elected. I think it's above the parties and it's my, but that's my personal conviction. So, um, and if the, if this is not the case, I mean, if the support to Ukraine is, um, is, um, is shrinking or not there anymore, I think that it will be up to the EU, to um, to and, and European countries. It's not only I mean uh, the UK, and it's uh, it's not only EU versus uh, non-EU, but I think it will be up to Europe and the rest of the international community to um, to continue to provide support. Because as I said, I really believe that um, the this is a beyond. I mean, very important for Ukraine, but very important for the world stability and for the future of Europe as a whole. Um, on um, on agriculture, uh, I think it will be it's it's going to be part of you know I was saying um, discussion on enlargement will be difficult and agriculture will be one of the difficult because it's not so much to protect Ukraine agriculture I think Ukraine agri agriculture is very competitive and and it's more the I mean how this. Um, Interact. So I think that will be. I'm not a specialist of CIP, so I, I, I cannot comment on the how it will be. It will, uh, um, like what kind of of uh, of solution and and way out in terms of you know how to integrate uh, Ukraine. But it's clear that, as I was saying, Ukraine potential in agriculture is also in the benefit of um, of Ukraine, but also in the benefit of the world because of the needs of the production and so forth. We see our role. We provide them quite a lot of support to agribusiness. So, so we have uh, invested a lot in, in the uh, agribusiness sector because it's a very important sector for Ukraine. And we see our role as helping these companies to um, to develop and uh, and to be to also be at the top in terms of standards and, and so forth, because to be able to export and to access EU market and so forth, they need to have the highest possible standard, be it in terms of environmental, social, um, say, um, um, safety, and, and so forth. So we we help them working on that and um, 
and, uh, uh, and so forth. But this will, of course, be part of the discussion uh, in terms of um, one of the difficult chapters in, in the accession uh, process. Um, and the, the question on infrastructure and so forth, I think it's very uh, what you said, I mean, that we need to we build the infrastructure, but up to the higher standard in terms of green transition and so forth. That's a, that's very clear. There is uh, um, there may be uh, sometimes you know in emergency we need first of all to rebuild so as to have the things up and running. But this question of of the quality and and having the best um, I mean best standard is very much uh, in our mind and in Ukrainian mind. I think so. That's that will be one driver. I think in the reconstruction. Thank you very much. Okay, let's see if there is another round of questions. In the while we are preparing the the hands to go up, I have one, uh, which is a bit back to what uh, Justin Cousin was asking earlier, and um, and is is some sort of Marshall plan for Ukraine in uh, in the cards? And I guess while there is little doubt that uh, DBRD will uh, continue to be heavily invested. In the future of Ukraine, how do you convince the other IFIs in a way to to commit? Um, so that that's a bit my question. But I will. I saw a couple of hands going up in the meantime. Um, yes, there was first year, and then we go back. Don't worry, we have ample time. Oh, hi there. My name is Nicholas. I work for BBC News. I'm just interested in your attitude towards well, Western attitude towards economic development in Ukraine and Russia. If you could go back in time to 1991, is there anything you think the West could have done differently? Thank you. In the back there, there is a hand. Hi, my name is Alexey. I'm an urban planning and policy fellow here at the LSE. So, um, Odilio, I think really rightly mentioned the uh, very great uh, decision-making capacity within Ukrainian government and uh, EB efforts to further support it. But um, the question is, how about the regional uh, and local decision-making capacity? Um, and also in light of the uh, Ukraine's decentralization reform, which is quite successful and, and uh, the pl plans is to straighten it probably, and with the EU accession process, with the um, rebuilding process, both processes probably require uh, a lot of uh, a strong state, a strong regional institutions. So uh, whether IBRD has any plans into that much wider process, being a much wider process of threatening the regional decision-making capacity, and and since we are at the sort of we are at the educational institution, right, and also research university, I would connect this question with the supporting not just capacity building and uh, super kind of super squads, which will deliver local reforms, which seems impossible for to deliver at such a large scale. What do you think about threatening Ukraine's policy and maybe urban and regional development education? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I think it's enough uh, for now. <laughs> so, um, fight an encompassing uh, round. So, uh, Marshall Plan, there were there have been a lot of talk about and a lot of comparison with Marshall Plan and so forth. And um, and I think indeed um, when when. Um, there were a lot of thought at the beginning, okay, the war will be very short and let's focus on reconstruction and design a Marshall Plan and so forth. The reality is slightly different, but, and the level of support, what is quite striking is the fact that uh, the level of support provided, economic support provided to Ukraine is in terms of, compared with the GDP of the country, GDP of Ukraine, much bigger than the Marshall Plan. So the, the so it's, it's one element, but of course, much more will be needed and, and for the reconstruction, but, so I'm sure there will be some um, uh, continued support for reconstruction. And, you know, there has already been this um, G7 EU platform, coordination platform, which is working on, you know, trying to bring together the EU, the, the G7 countries, largest donors on working on what should be done in the short term, but also in the medium term and in terms of prioritization of investment, prioritization of reform and, and so forth. So that's um, 
that's important. And I'm sure, I mean, there will be also the, the stake, I think the issue will not be so much to bring other IFIs, but to bring private sector and to, to, to convince private sector that it's an opportunity, it's a good investment for them and they should uh, save the opportunity. Um, the question of what we should have done differently um, in, back in 1991, um, it's a difficult one. I think that being aware of the difference, I mean, the approach was a bit one size fits all, open the market, they were, I mean, um, um, and, and so forth. And probably um, sometimes, I think one of the big, big mistakes was to let oligarchs, you know, take. Um, and and it was you know saving the assets and benefits from uh, from because I think that doesn't that have not helped democratic transformation of the countries and uh, um, and open and vibrant private sector and so forth. So I I think this was a um, this was a, a mistake. I'm not sure it was so easy to avoid, and I'm not sure we have the toll. But but I think this this was um, this has probably uh, been an issue. Um, Insist also a lot on the policy reform and and uh, not only on the financing and so forth, but on the deeper transformation. I think that we, uh, for example, in EBRD, we embraced more and more policy, included more and more policy work in our um, in our um, activity, and not only focus on investment and and uh, helping bring new investment, but also helping deepest transformation of the country. Um, on um, Regional and local decision making, it's a very important point because I, I agree with you that the um, decentralization reform in Ukraine is a big success. I mean, it was a big success before the war. I think it's, it's a big asset in terms also of you know, balancing the power, um, ensuring that, I mean, you have more, um, I mean, citizenship, I mean, it's, I mean, another way to express not only at the national level and so forth. Um, there is a bit of tension, I think, in the war situation, uh, because you have some, uh, and it's quite logic, you can understand, for, exam for example, the finance ministry, finance minister, they want to have control on all the financing with their guarantee going to local authorities. So there is a tendency to centralize and to have a, to have a capacity to say, well, the financing to this area is more important and more urgent than the financing to another area, depending on the need and so forth. And in a war, you can understand that, but I really believe that it's important also to keep some autonomy decision making at, at local level. What we do, we, we, we do not work at local level on reform agenda and so forth, but what we do is working on prioritization of investment and we can land at local level without state guarantee. So at, you know, sub-sovereign without state, and this is a way for us, and we've been working with municipalities in order to finance their priorities in uh, reconstruction, uh, developing uh, new, I mean, uh, new capacities because of the refugee situation and so forth. So that's what we are doing, but, but indeed, I think that's a key element uh, in the future of Ukraine, this decentralization and, and having a sort of well-structured local level. Thank you very much. Okay, so I promise to go back uh, the last row uh, and then next to it, and then we go here. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, my name is Rusana, I'm from Ukraine. And uh, as far as I, uh, we know, the key priorities for the war-torn uh, country are um, keeping up the economic growth and establishing the defense industry. And considering that Russia has put its entire economy on the war footing, is there a political will within investors or shareholders of the UBRD, or maybe even an investment strategy of turning Ukraine into a, a European um, military production hub? Thank you. Next to, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. I am a master's student here at LSE. What I was curious about is this has obviously been a very dynamic process, uh, kind of traversing the war as an international institution. What would you say are the lessons that you have taken away that in future conflicts you might apply that the EBRD was not aware of before? Since we have 
roughly almost five, a bit more than five minutes left. Maybe we gather the last two questions, if you agree there, and then over there. Hello, my name is Michal. I also am a master's student here at LSC. And uh, I have a question. As EBRD, how do you ensure that the investments that go to Ukraine uh, support the establishment of small and medium-sized companies? and do not disproportionately benefit the, the oligarchs uh, who still possess a significant power in a number of sectors, like the previously mentioned uh, agriculture. Thank you very much. And last question there. Um, uh, thank you for your talk. I'm Thomas, uh, in the double degree between Bocconi and the LSE. And you slightly touch upon on the idea of bringing in private capital as well, as it's going to be needed for the complete reconstruction of Ukraine. And I was wondering a bit more concretely, what are the steps that the EBRD is thinking about? Is it more on structural reform or more on the type of loans or providing perhaps a larger share of guarantees, for example? I wondered yeah, a bit more concretely what the EBRD was doing for this. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. Uh, so on military production, we cannot finance military productions. We, we cannot finance uh, defense industry and so forth. And uh, uh, I will, um, we have, for example, uh, um, in our share, among our shareholders, Azerbaijan and Armenia, these two countries have been fighting. We cannot start, you know, financing defense for one. And so in the case of Ukraine, the situation is quite specific, but I mean, this is something we, we cannot do. And um, and uh, so I I think that in a way it's de it's being developed with uh, um, demand from the government and with the, because of the need I mean the financing of the government um, and there may be some bilateral support but it's not for for a major bank like us. Um, Lessons that we have taken away, I think that um, from from the experience, um, I think that um, the agility. How do you, in in front of a crisis, really adjust your tools and and really measure? I mean, measure what you can do, take a risk, and how do you find solution to I mean, to to deal uh, with the so this is capacity to be agile. I think has been very, uh, and we always strive to be more agile. I mean, we always have our own uh, constraint and so forth. And I think being reactive to the situation is is, is uh, and being able to react quickly to an evolving environment is is very important for an institution like us. Um, I think that, um, you know, not, as I was saying, we, we, we really believe at the beginning that we will not get any more structural reform because it was a war. I think this was a, a false impression, I mean, a false assumption. So being also, um, I mean, really looking at what's going on and, and rather than assuming that something will happen uh, or not. Um, and... Uh, um, um, yes, that would be the, what of the um, and and last point maybe is uh, um, we are um, you know financial institution working a lot on on finance private sector and so forth but the human capital is uh, one very important dimension and we see that in the war in a situation like Ukraine where at some point you also need to take that into consideration how you can help companies your clients to deal with the situation of you know, the, the, where, where the um, uh, workforce is, how they can manage the workforce in a very exceptional time. So. Um, on, uh, on the support of SMEs, how we select our clients and so forth. So first, first of all, we are very stringent and we have a very strong due diligence on integrity. And, uh, and we know the country well, so we are very clear that, I mean, we do not work with oligarchs and, and this is a very clear position uh, that we have. Uh, so we, we look deep into who are the counterparts, I mean, the direct, indirect, and so forth, and who is the ultimate owner of the companies in which we work and so forth. Um, and that's what, I mean, in terms of rep the reputation is, is uh, very important. So that's uh, one key asset for us. And to support SMEs, what we've been doing is, uh, so we can support them directly for, I mean, um, relatively, I mean, above 5 million, we can finance directly SMEs. But we've been developing product with banks. The banks in Ukraine are very liquid, so they, they do not need credit lines, but they need risk sharing. So, they, so what we've been doing is guaranteeing portfolio, banking portfolio of lending to SMEs and, and uh, 
And so, and this has been very effective. We work with uh, almost all banks in Ukraine, developing this kind of uh, guarantee. And I believe that with our uh, intervention, we basically cover one quarter of the financing for SMEs in Ukraine. So guaranteeing them in a way or another. So I think that's a very effective, uh, um, effective tool. And uh, we've just signed last week a, a new law, a new guarantee scheme for public sector bank uh, with which we work. And um, how to bring private investors? So uh, we believe, first of all, that the fact that we invest helps to create confidence and to show that uh, uh, counterparty is credible, um, in in um, we can uh, has the integrity required, and so forth. So playing the role of an illustrative, showing that. Uh, we also co-financing and providing some financing to a company is also a way to help them and to provide some sort of, you know, because we have the capacity also to work with the public sector. So if we are investing in a company, then, I mean, it's a way to provide some security in relation to that. And um, and we are working some on some specific uh, product related to um, how to facilitate transit in Ukraine, so transportation of goods, uh, because there is no insurance anymore. It's very, I mean, impossible to get insurance if you want to, to have a truck transporting grain. Or, and so developing, bringing the market back, for example, is something on which we are working and we are trying to find ways with the private sector to provide this kind of, of uh, insurance. So we are, I mean, on all the different, and of course the policy work we, has, we are doing with the ombudsman and so forth, improving the environment for business is also an important element of that. So thank you very much. Uh, we come to the end of our event. Um, it has been a great pleasure, I guess, for, for me and I hope for all of you uh, to participate in this evening's uh, event on um, you sharing the vision of the BRD on the future of Ukraine. So thank you all for being here and for the audience online. And a very special thanks to President Renaud Basso for being here. Thank you.